Morning. How's everybody? You're doing well? Even with last night? Uh, okay. Oh. Oh, I don't want to lose this. I need some help. You come up here, help me for a second. Yeah, Mike, come on up here. I just don't want to lose this. Would you hold on to this until the end of the service and give it back to me? Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. So I don't lose it. All right, we're going to study in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4 this morning. And uh, if you have a Bible, let's open up together there to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul is wrapping up his argument on how to overcome the divisions in the church that are created when we make too much of our leaders, and we set them against each other by creating a schism. I follow this person, I follow that person. This is the wrap-up, for the most part, of this long argument that began in the first chapter where Paul commended them for who they were, but then he's been really hammering down, why are you splitting up around personalities? This is an important passage for another um, sort of transferable concept, which I wanna drill into by asking the question, um, should we care about what people think about us? How much should we care about what people think about us? I would describe one of the idols of the day in which we live is the love of the approval of men. How much do we want people to like us, follow us, click after us? What's being created by the desire to have people who affirm everything about us, and uh, probably most of us have made a lot of decisions in our life based upon how will someone else perceive what I'm about to do, and then we make a decision because we want them to like us. Now, this is a reasonable idea to a certain extent because the Proverbs actually have a word to us about having a good reputation and a good name. In Proverbs um, chapter 22 and verse one says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, and favor is better than silver and gold. How many would agree with that? Yeah, I didn't think so, we like riches, so you can think of me whatever you want, just give me the riches. But you know, in the mind of God, it's like a wise person that sort of has an idea about my reputation matters. And even if I had everything but my reputation was ruined, um, that's a deal. Does it matter what people think about us? When the early church began to choose leaders in 1 Timothy, uh, there's a list of requirements for someone who will be a leader in the church. And one of the requirements is the elder must have, be well thought of by outsiders, um, lest he fall into disgrace in the snare of the devil. Like it matters what people think about the leader to a certain extent. Is it, how, how much do you want the approval of other people? I want to be respected and I want to be liked. Um, and yet, the, the approval of other people is not, it can't be king. Jesus actually talked about this in John chapter 12. It is recorded that many of the leaders of the Jewish community became followers of Jesus. They believed in who Jesus was. But the Bible indicates that while the leaders believed in him for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from men more than the glory that comes from God. How much do you want people to like you? That's at the heart of what Paul is gonna argue this morning 
there is a sense in which it's helpful for people to think well of us, but I want to suggest, especially if you're at a young age, because as you get older, you don't care as much. But when you're young, it's like, I want people to like me. And it just has to be moderated a bit by some of the texts that we're going to look at this morning. And it's in the flow of the argument, Paul saying, this is who I am, this is who Apollos is. And so he begins. In verse 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, this is the way you should think about us. In other words, you're thinking about us as leaders that you're following, but this is the way, can we go to the next verse? This is how you should regard us. You should consider us in this way. And I want you to circle a couple of words in your journal or your Bible as servants of Christ and as stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. Now, there are four words in these two verses that I want you to focus in on. Paul says, I want you to think about us in this way. I don't really care if you think about us as really being eloquent because we never try to have most eloquent speech. And I say amen to that. I'm not a very good speaker, but if I can get the word of God to you in a simple way, I love it when people say afterwards, oh, your messages are so simple. I know. But Paul said, this is the way I want you to think about me. I want you to think about me in four ways. One, as a servant of Christ. I'm an apostle. I'm the least of the apostles, but I want you to regard me as a servant of Christ. And every leader in any church that glorifies Christ needs to think that the primary role of the leader is servant. This is exactly what Jesus said uh, in Matthew 20. He said, everybody around you wants to lord it over people, but not so among you. Whoever um, wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever would be first must be last. Even as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. You want to be a leader? Be a servant. Um, the etymology of the word servant comes from being in a boat as an under rower so that you had a big vessel going through the sea and you couldn't see them because they were underneath, but there were a group of servants who were rowing the boat unseen by anybody on land or nearby or on the boat itself, they were the under rowers making things happen. They were serving the master, serving the captain. And that's what Paul says, I want you to think about me in that way. Everybody who's been a great leader has to be a servant, it's what Jesus did. It's spoken of Moses, who was the greatest leader in the Old Testament and led the people out of Israel, that Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify of the things that would be spoken later. So even in the Old Testament, a great leader was a servant. Most people who want to be great today want the platform, they want the accolades, they want to be acknowledged. And the whole economy of God is upside down, that if you want to be great in God's eyes and the world's eyes, you have to take up a towel and wash one another's feet. Now, the second word that's on here is the word steward. Think about me as a servant of Christ and a steward of the mysteries of God. A steward is simply someone to whom something has been entrusted. So someone receives what is not theirs, and they're going to take care of it on behalf of the one who is the legitimate, rightful owner of those things. So maybe in your minds you're thinking about Jesus' parables and he goes off and he gets people together and he says, I'm going to give you five of my talents and I'm going to come back and I'm, you're going to have to give an account of what I gave to you. Um, that's a steward, someone to whom something has been entrusted. And then the master comes back and says, what would you do with my five? I made ten. Great. Well done. Good and, everybody? Faithful. Steward, enter into the joy of your master. That, that's the concept. 
It's not yours. In the Greco-Roman world, a steward was an actual position in a household. So it would be like, um, whatever, maybe you have a steward that takes care of everything at your house. Oh, you're it. Okay. uh, But a steward would be responsible for everything in the house, the finances, the facility, um, the, the menu, the provisions in the pantry. A, a steward would take care of all of those things. And uh, even the other people who were in the house watched the children or if there were other servants, a steward would be in charge of everything. Now here's the key. A steward owned virtually nothing but was responsible for virtually everything. He was in charge, a manager, and he was always accountable to the master, always answerable to the one who owned everything. So Paul's saying, I want you to think of me as simply being one in charge of something that's not really my own. It belongs to a master, and I'm responsible to take care of it. Now, what is he taking care of? First service got it. Okay, let's go back. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ, stewards of the, what's he responsible for? The mysteries of God. Now that could be a little confusing if you think that mystery means a riddle or something hard to figure out, but the word mystery is simply used to describe something that previously had not been known and now has been revealed. So in time, Paul the apostle, first century, Christ has come into the world and Paul has been entrusted with the treasures of the mystery of redemption promised in the Old Testament, fulfilled in Christ, all of the treasure of the gospel, the good news that Christ has paid for sins and the good news of the gospel that whoever believes in him shall not perish. Paul says, what I preach to you, Christ crucified for sinners, was previously not revealed, it's now revealed and that's what I'm in charge of. I'm responsible to declare to you the good news of the gospel. You should think of me of simply being responsible to tell you about Christ, which is why earlier he said, um, I came to you with fear and trembling. I was kind of anxious about preaching to you, but all I want to know among you is Christ and him crucified. That's it. Now, when a preacher goes off the rails and talks about every other thing except the mystery, the treasures of the gospel, the church goes sideways. And Paul is really describing the primary work of the spiritual leader is I serve God, I'm a servant of Christ, and I preach the good news of the gospel. And when preachers, pastors, leaders don't do that, that's where the church goes sideways. Would you agree? So, I mean, even in my case, without becoming too personal here, but I like to think of myself as being a servant to the church, but you're not my master. You're not the boss of me, kids used to say (laughs) to each other. You're not the boss of me. Who's my boss? Has to be Christ. And what am I to do here but to take the, the, the riches of the truth of God and say to you, this is what God says. And when I begin to go into my own opinions and tell you how to vote, which I'd like to do in a second, <laughs> no, I wouldn't. Like, I want to take this and say, this is what God says. But when I go sideways and do something like that, it's like you say, whoa, what's the role? Paul said, this is the way you should think about me. I serve Christ, and I serve up the treasures of God, and that's it. And that's what has to happen here. And now let's look at the criteria for being good at those two things. Moreover, it is required of stewards, and he zeroes in on the stewardship that you've been given something. Oh, before we go to that, can I just say stewardship? is you've been given something and it's not yours and you might have to give it back. 
And every one of us in the room have been given so much from God. And you just think about your material wealth, your physical health, which changes and goes up and down. And in the spiritual sense, you've been given a spiritual gift from God. Every one of you who know Jesus at the moment you were saved, the Holy Spirit imparted a spiritual gift to you for the good of the rest of us. Peter says, as each one has received a gift, use it for one another as good, what do you think the word is? Stewards of the manifold grace of God. If you preach, preach with the wisdom of God. If you serve with the strength of God, you are a steward. And one day, every one of us, even as we saw last week, are going to stand before God and give account of our life. What have you done with what God gave to you? That's what Paul's talking about here. You're a steward. So maybe we should just think about uh, retrospectively, introspectively, what do you have that God has uniquely given to you, and what are you doing with it? Paul said, I want you to think of us as stewards. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found, everyone, faithful. It does not say be found successful, that you be found popular, that you be found large, that you be found winsome, that you be found uh, faithful. It's the word actually that means reliable, that you are trustworthy. Uh, Someone can rely on you for what you said you're going to do. My friend once asked me, um, in talking with his grandkids, he said, I asked my grandkids one time, what's the worst thing that somebody could say to you? What's the worst thing someone could say about you? And they got all out there nasty words. They could call me this, they could call me that, and you could, you could fill in, what's the worst thing somebody could say to you? He said, no, it's not that. It's not you're a son of a, <laughs> you're not your expletive. The worst thing someone could say about you, I don't trust you. Like you're not reliable. If you have a reputation that you cannot be trusted, your world's gonna get very small. Would you agree? And when a steward is simply taking care of something that's not really even his, hers, the best thing you do is say, I'm reliable, I will take care of this. And I will do the best I can with what has been given to me, and I will return it. And that's what Paul's saying. I want to be faithful as a steward and rely on him. Now, one of the things that was very important to Paul was the continuation of leadership in the local church. So at one point in 2 Timothy, Paul said um, to Timothy, what you have heard from me in the presence of of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men, reliable men that will be able to teach others also. A a faithfulness to God is the criteria really for being successful in the church. So remember what Paul's saying, don't, don't set us in schisms, this is the way you should think of me. I serve Christ and I handle the scriptures and I want to be faithful to that. Verse three. Verse 3 says, but with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. Remember, they were saying, Paulus is better than you, Paul. And he said, it's a, small thing. I don't, it's a very small thing to be judged by you. Now we hear the, sort of the contrary to a good name. It's like, I don't really care what you think about me. Can you say that to people who are not important? I mean, there are some people who are important that it's right to say, I do care what my parents think. I I do care what my mentors think. Um, But Paul said, it's a very small thing for me to be judged by you, for you to put me in the dock and sort of evaluate who I am. Uh, It's a small thing. To be judged is to investigate. And Paul was saying, "I, I don't I don't really care that much about what you think or even any human court that would evaluate me. In fact, I don't even judge myself. Now listen to what he's saying. He's not um, over concerned about the opinions of other people. And he's not overly introspective about himself. 
Like I, I look at myself and I don't even, I mean, it's a pretty bold statement. I, I don't even judge myself. And I think the takeaway for us is just to be careful not to be the slave of other people's opinions and not to be so self-focused on ourselves that we're always thinking, how am I doing, how am I doing, how am I doing? Now, Paul said, I, I don't have anything against me. If we go to the next verse, verse 4 says, um, I don't even judge myself. And I, I'm not actually aware of anything against myself. I'm not sure I can always say that <laughs> about myself. But Paul had a clear conscience, and he said, I, I don't judge myself. I, don't, I can't think of anything against me. But I'm not thereby acquitted just because I think I'm doing good and I'm doing a great job. Uh, you know, that doesn't mean it's true. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked, and sometimes I don't really know what's going on in my heart. But Paul was saying, I, as I judge myself, I can't think of anything about me. Um, it's the Lord who judges me. I answer to the Lord in my life. Now, I love that there are sort of three judgments here. What do people think? What do I think about myself? And what's the final judgment I should live my life by? What does the Lord think? It's really hard to get those lined up because we're drawn a lot of time. Let me see if I can illustrate. Um, I love when Deion Sanders came to town. He came to town with some awesome interviews. And uh, I kind of hesitate to use him as an example, but listen to what he said. When he got to town, somebody asked him a question, um, and it was very critical, the question about who he was. And you can picture him sitting there behind his sunglasses, and he said, what about me makes would make me think that I care about your opinion of me? <laughs> what about me who would make me think that I care about your opinion of me? Um, you ain't make me, you can't break me. You didn't build me, you can't kill me. God established me. I didn't do justice to it, but it was prime, prime Dion. Like, what makes, me, what makes you think I care about what you think about me? There's a little sense in which it's actually kind of freeing to say, I care a lot less about what people think about me today. It's a small thing to be judged by any human court which is a deal when you start preaching the gospel in a town like Boulder and you say there is one holy God and everybody's a sinner and you're separated from God and unless you repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you cannot be saved. That's an offensive message in a self-made town like Boulder. Would you agree? And you're going to get some heat and it should be sort of a small thing that we get heat about what the world thinks about us. I don't even judge myself. You should be careful about being over introspective, thinking about yourself all the time. How am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? What Paul says, the Lord's going to judge me. So just let's get our eyes on the Lord and follow him. Stop thinking about yourself. Stop thinking about what other people think and follow the Lord. Reminds me of a great Old Testament passage, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord. You can say it with me. With all your heart, in all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. And don't forget to lean not on your own understanding. You know, don't lean on your own understanding. Don't think about you. Think about the Lord and follow him. I think that's what Paul's saying here in all of this text. I'm not aware of anything in myself. Verse 5, therefore, do not pronounce judgment until the time before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness, who will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. A couple things to note here. When the Lord comes back, this, this takes us back to last week, that um, you can build your life with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, uh, but one day the work is going to be evaluated by God and it's going to be brought to light. It's going to be a comprehensive assessment. Everything will be examined. 
is be brought to light. You know what it's like to open the shades before you vacuum? You can see a lot better. Or you vacuum and then you open the shades and you have to get the vacuum out again. It's like the sun shows where it is. The light will expose what's in darkness. And I love that what it says, that what's primarily going to be exposed is not how successful our work was, how big it was, but the purposes of the heart. Man looks on the outside, and Paul's saying, when I stand before the Lord, what the Lord is primarily going to evaluate my life is what was going on on the inside of me when I went to work, when I preached the gospel. And I've stood here for a lot of years, and I can tell you it's easy to get up and have the wrong motives for preaching. And it's, it's just what we have to say to God, I want my heart to be yours. And this is what Paul's saying. You, we're all going to stand before him and give an account here. Verse 6, he says, I've applied this to myself and Apollos for your benefit. What I'm talking about here is that you will learn from what I'm saying here about Apollos and me being in the church together, both having a part, both going to be rewarded from the Lord. I'm telling you, do not go beyond what is written. It's an interesting phrase because you can't find any place in the Bible where, you know, this is specifically said, but I think it's easy to make a case that all throughout the Bible, anybody who gets proud about human beings is, you get disciplined and put down. He who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Don't be, go beyond what is written, namely, that none of you should be puffed up in favor of one leader against another leader. <coughs> Excuse me, don't divide the church in pride. He's calling the church to be really broken and humble about all of this. And um, he concludes in this way in verse 7. Three questions. See if you can give the intended answer in verse 7. For who sees anything different in you? What's the answer? Yeah, first service didn't get it either. I, I think it's just like there's an implied answer. Or maybe another way to say that, who's, who, who, who sees anything different in you is like, what makes you so special? How are you different than everybody else? And the answer is, yeah, in a sense, I'm really not. I'm not that special. But this one's easier. What do you have that you did not receive? What's the answer to that? Okay, the Christian understands that you don't have anything that wasn't a gift from God. You even give us the power to create wealth. Everything we have is a gift from God. And Paul's saying to this proud group of people in the church, you know what? What do you have that you didn't receive? Nothing. And if you did receive it, why do you boast as if you didn't receive it? Why are you boasting? Stop boasting. This is a call to humility in the church. Stop getting yourself up about yourself and about other leaders. Keep yourself broken and humble and holy before the Lord. Um, And understand that everything that you have is really a gift from the Lord. For those of you who were with us last week, you could just click back to verse 21 and 22 and 23 of chapter 3 where he says, everything's yours. What do you have that you didn't receive? Nothing. What do you have? I actually have everything. I've got the world. I've got life. I've got Paul, Apollos, Cephas. I've got um, all the leaders in my church. All of it's mine. And so you've been given so much, so stop being so proud about what you think you're so special about. That's a little convicting, isn't it? Now, the last few verses in chapter 8, we won't go too much detail, but if you like sarcasm, how many of you like sarcasm? Okay, this is a good section to read because Paul is actually being uh, kind of snarky with them in these verses. And in chapter uh, 4, verse 8, and he goes, already you have everything you want. Already you've become rich. Without us, you're like kings. Because remember, they're being so puffed up in the local church. I wish you were kings and you did reign that we could rule with you. You know, you can hear a little attitude, can't you? For I think that God has exhibited us apostles, now he's going to talk about himself, as the last of all, like men sentenced to death 
because we've been a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you're wise. We're weak, but you're strong. You're held in honor. We're in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We're poorly dressed. We're buffeted, homeless. We labor. We work with our own hands. Two jobs. We're reviled. We bless. Uh, When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become, and we still are, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Now, you get his tone like, stop thinking yourself so great. This is what it's really like to be a leader, to be a servant, to be an apostle in a day that hates us. The world thinks that we're stupid, foolish, and they think of us as the scum of the world. That's the word that was used, that was put on, you know, when you finish your dinner and you didn't eat everything, and the stuff you pushed over to the side and it's there on your dish, or you left the pan on the fire a little bit longer and what's in the bottom of the pan That's the scum, the dregs at the end. And you scrape it out and you put it over the sink now and you put it down the garbage disposal and it goes away. And Paul says, that's what the world thinks about us. We're like the scum that goes down the garbage disposal. That's all that people think about us. Ah, but you're rich, you're wise. You you be on television. You slick your hair back and wear a big suit and big rings and fly private jet and you, ah. You know, I'm just being serious. That's real. And that's what was happening. People puffed up, and Paul was saying, this is what it means to be concerned about. What does God think? What does the world think? Are there any questions? Do you get it? It's like driving down. Be careful how you live with each other. There's three verses that I, I put to end our time together here about how people think about us. One is First Thessalonians chapter 4. In First Thessalonians cha- uh, chapter 2, excuse me, uh, Paul said... But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please men, but to please God. Here's the tension going. Paul's thinking, I'm a Christian leader, I'm an apostle, and I've been given the gospel of God not to please men, but to please God. Again, in Galatians, in Galatians, Paul said, for am I now seeking the approval of men? Do I want people just to love me? Or am I, uh, am I trying to please God? If I'm trying to please men, I could not be the servant of Christ. If it's only important that the world loves me, you can't please God. It has to be that God is first. And there are going to be times where that comes into conflict. But you're a servant of God and you're a steward of the mysteries of God. The last verse, in 1 Corinthians, we'll get to this later, chapter 10, verse 32 He actually says, this is how you should live in the world. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks. Don't don't try to offend the world. Don't be obnoxious. Um, Or don't offend the church. You know, don't be a jerk. That's that's the living shirk translation. You know, just don't try to be offensive. Just as I, what, this is Paul, I try to please everyone in everything I do. What? Not seeking my own advantage, but that, I, that of many they may be saved. What's the guiding principle? I'm a steward of the mysteries of the gospel, and I will do everything that that will go forward. And sometimes that'll be offensive, but I don't want to try to be offensive. I want to try to make the truth about the gospel very appealing so that people may be saved. We're going to see. To the Jew, I become like a Jew. To the Greek, I become like a Greek. I try to be all things to all men that I might win some. Why? Because I want to be, you know, received by people. But ultimately, I want to be faithful as a steward to God who's given me everything. Let's pray together. Dear Father, thank you that you, um, you open our eyes to see who we are in you. And I 
pray that we'll get a vision for our life as living in a world um, trying to be not enslaved by the opinions of others, but under the rule of Christ, and not being ashamed of the gospel, but being able to tell it well in a world that it might be received. And I thank you that all that we have is from you. We really are, in a sense, in every part of our life, stewards of what you've given to us. And so we pray you'll help us to be just what you ask, faithful, even as you are faithful. And we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God help us this week as we live for Christ. Oh, my $100 bill. You bring that up here? Come on up here. Let's see. Yep, it's good. Took care of it. Thanks for being faithful. Take care of that. Don't Just stay here. And for illustrating, taking care of that. It's good. It's in good shape. No interest, but did good on that. And thanks for being the illustration. We are in Christ. We are in Christ, and Christ is in God, and all things are yours. Okay. Lord, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Never thought that would happen in church, did you? Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to learn a lesson today about being uh, stewards. Uh, we, we just say everything that we have is from you, for you. And I pray that you'll bless us as we live this week with you in our, our mind uh, to be free from the opinions of men to the extent we can and to be eyes focused on Christ in all that we do so that to you be the glory in our life through the church now and forevermore we all pray. Amen. Thanks for helping us out. No, that's all.